So this question is definitely going to be one of those ones where we have to break it down into manageable steps in order to solve parts A and B. Now in part A, we do need to find two projection angles that will allow this proton to reach its target. And the first step to doing that is to calculate the time of flight. Now to calculate the time of flight, we're gonna actually do it this way. We're gonna calculate the time of flight to reach the peak of the arc. So in other words, we're gonna get the time required to reach this peak right here. And then what we'll do is we'll double it because then that will give us the expression for the time required to reach the target. So in order to help us understand that, we're gonna actually scroll down here and draw a little picture. And we've drawn that picture right here. So again, the proton is fired at a particular projection angle here, and then it's going to follow this parabolic trajectory. And then at the peak of the flight, you might remember from when you studied projectile motion, that at the peak of the flight, the final velocity in the y direction is going to equal zero meters per second. And so what we've done is we've filled in a chart here and let's focus first on the y direction information. As just noted, the final velocity in the y direction is going to be zero meters per second. You might also remember from projectile motion that the y component of the initial velocity right here would be symbolized by v naught times the sine of theta. So we've also filled that in to represent the initial velocity in the y direction. Now, we wanna talk about the acceleration. Ordinarily, in projectile motion questions, you probably would have filled in an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. However, in this case, we have a different situation because of the presence of the electric field. Now, we know there's an electric field directed downward, and that electric field will actually create an electric force on the proton. We have learned in this chapter that the electric force that would be acting on the proton would equal the charge of the proton multiplied by the magnitude of the electric field. And so this is the main force. Now there is still a gravitational force also pulling down on the proton, but it turns out that that gravitational force is much smaller than this electrical force. So in essence, we're going to disregard the gravitational force here because its magnitude is much, much less than the magnitude of the electric field. So that kind of made this question a little bit tricky was to recognize that fact. So in essence, this electrical force right here is the net force because we're disregarding the gravitational force. Now, Newton told us that if we have a net force, then we can set that equal to the mass of the object. So we'll just say mass of proton times the acceleration of that object. So what we'll do is solve this for the acceleration. We're going to divide both sides of this by the mass of the proton. And when we do that, that'll cancel out the mass of the proton on the right-hand side here. We'll just kind of omit that now. And now we can see that the excel, oh my, the acceleration of the proton is going to equal this expression right here. So why don't we go ahead and actually calculate that because that way we can then fill it into our table. So we'll come down here and calculate that acceleration. Remember, this is for the y direction and that acceleration was Q times E divided by the mass of the proton. Now the question gives us the value of E, that is the magnitude of the electrical field strength right there. And then as far as the charge and mass of a proton, those are known values. So let's go ahead and plug them in. So there we have it, we've plugged in those values. We're gonna calculate this acceleration now. And when we do that, we get about 6.9 times 10 to the power of 10. And this is in meters per second squared. Notice how much larger that number is compared to 9.8. 9.8 is much, much less than this. And that's another perspective on why we could ignore gravity. Furthermore, this acceleration will be downward. We remember that the electric field was pointing downward. The proton is a positive charge. Positive charges will be pushed in the same direction as the electric field kind of like a fish swimming downstream, if you will. So the electrical force will indeed point downward and that makes the acceleration negative. So we can go back into our table and we can fill in this acceleration, negative 6.9 times 10 to the 10th meters per second squared. Okay, now we are ready to calculate the time. Remember, this is the time required to reach 
the peak of the trajectory, we have to turn over to one of our kinematics equations. And it looks like, based on our information in the y direction, we would use the following. So we know that the final velocity in the y direction would equal the initial velocity in the y direction plus the acceleration in the y direction times the time. We're going to solve this for time, so we'll subtract the initial velocity from both sides. And then we'll divide both sides by the acceleration. Now we'll clear out some space and we'll begin to plug in what we know. Remember that the final velocity was zero in the y direction, so we have zero minus. The initial velocity in the y direction was this v naught sine of theta. So we'll fill that in. And we'll divide this by that acceleration, which had that very large negative value. Now this is kind of an ugly expression, admittedly. The zero in front won't really matter. Zero minus v naught sine theta. We can just cancel out that. Then we have the two negatives, so those are going to cancel out as well. So this is kind of our expression here for the time. But remember, our strategy was to double this time. Because right now, this expression only represents the time to reach the peak. We want an expression for the time to reach the target way down here. So based on the symmetry of the scenario, we would just double this time. So we'll stick a 2 in front of here, and this becomes the expression for the time required to reach the target. So far, so good. But now, let's turn to the x direction and talk about what's going on there. So we've redrawn the picture. Now we're looking at the full range of the projectile. We do remember that the initial velocity in the x direction was v naught cos theta. So we're going to fill that back into our table here. We know that the time required to reach that target, that full range, was the expression we developed earlier. So that's 2 v naught sine theta divided by that crazy acceleration value. And then the delta x would be the displacement. Now from the picture, we've represented that displacement along the x direction using the capital R to represent the range. And then, of course, we recall from projectile motion that the acceleration in the x direction is actually zero. There are no electrical or gravitational forces acting in the horizontal direction. So that is an important recollection. We can now turn back to kinematics and look at one of the equations. We recall that delta x was equal to the initial velocity in the x direction times the time plus 1 half times the acceleration in the x direction times time squared. Now as noted, the acceleration in the x direction is zero. So this term right here actually cancels out. And then we can begin to plug in some values. Now the delta x is symbolized by r, the range. This will equal the initial velocity in the x direction, which was the v naught cosine of theta. And then we're going to multiply that by the expression we developed for the time. And that was that 2 v naught sine of theta divided by the acceleration. Now, an interesting thing happens here in regards to trigonometry. Maybe some of us out there remember the following identity. Sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cos theta. I know a lot of us would be like, well, where did that come from? But that, believe it or not, is assumed to be requisite knowledge here. I'm not sure whose decision it was. But we can see from our expression here that we have 2 multiplied by sine theta multiplied by cosine theta. That's the same thing as this, 2 multiplied by sine theta multiplied by cosine theta. And we can see from the identity that we can substitute in sine of 2 theta. So let's just manipulate this a little bit. And we're going to plug in 2 sine theta, excuse me, that was the original. We're going to be plugging in sine of 2 theta. That sine of 2 theta is going to be substituted for all that information right there. And then we actually have v naught times v naught, so we can write that as v naught squared. And then that's divided by that acceleration. Now we are getting somewhere. Why don't we try to solve this next for the sine of 2 theta? So we'll multiply both sides of the equation by the acceleration value, and then divide both sides by the v naught squared. This will equal the sine of 2 theta. Now we have all of these values. We can go back up and grab the value of r, which was the 1.27 millimeters.
and then the initial velocity was 9,550 meters per second. As far as that 1.27 millimeters is concerned, you want to convert that into meters. So 1.27 millimeters, you'd have to multiply that by 10 to the minus 3 to get it into meters. And then multiply by the acceleration. And then divided by that initial velocity squared. So 9,550 meters per second and then squared. Now, when we process all that stuff on the left side, we're going to get about 0.961. This is equal to sine of two theta. Now, some of us will remember how to continue solving for two theta here. You'd actually have to do the inverse sine on both sides. Now, another piece of trigonometry comes up here. These will cancel out, and this will give us just two theta, of course. But when we do the inverse sine here, we punch it into our calculator and we get 73.9 degrees, which is one of the answers. But, and not to digress too much, but you might remember that when the sine of an angle is equal to a positive value, that there's actually two quadrants where sine is positive. The first quadrant is sine is positive and the second quadrant also has a positive value for sine. So not only will we have an angle equal to 73.9 degrees, which represents the first quadrant answer, we'll have another angle over in the second quadrant. Now, that angle would be swept out by this sort of red arc right here. And to figure that angle out, we recall that this angle here is the reference angle, which would also be the 73.9 degrees. So to figure out that larger angle that's swept out to get us into the second quadrant, we'd have to subtract 73.9 from 180. So when you do that, you get 106 degrees, roughly. So this is 106 degrees. That will also equal 2 theta. So just keep in mind you had two answers going here. You had the quadrant 1 answer as well as the quadrant 2 answer. And that's because sine is equal to a positive decimal. And that places it in both the first and the second quadrant. And so we still need to finish solving for theta in each case. We divide by 2 on both sides. You take the 73.9 and divide that by 2, you're going to get an angle equal to about 37 degrees, roughly. We'll call it 37.0. So that's one answer. And then take the 106 and divide that by 2, and you're going to get about 53 degrees. So those would be the two projection angles, if that's what they called them. Those are the two answers to part A. Well, holy smokes, there's a part B. We go back up, and we need the total duration of flight in each case. So luckily, we have this expression for the time. That's going to be very useful to us in solving for the time in each case. So let's just paste that right here. Why don't we do the time for the 37 degree angle first? You'll just plug into this expression here. You'll plug 37 in for theta and then the 9550 in for V naught. There we have it. And when you punch that into your calculator, you're going to get about 1.66 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So that would be the correct time of flight for the 37 degree angle. We'll make a similar calculation for the 53 degree angle. So there are the values plugged in and when you punch this in you're going to get about 2.21 roughly times 10 to the minus 7 seconds. Those would be the two answers for each of the two projection angles in part B. Thanks for taking the time to endure that video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it. But of course, please don't feel obligated. Thank you for taking the time to watch regardless.